So your child and, and you have navigated so much to get to this point. You've really worked on where to apply, what's the right fit as far as colleges go, um, the SATs, the ACTs, um, where to apply, how to apply, all of that you've dealt with. And some people have been getting uh, word from colleges, they've been getting acceptances. So this, the good news has started already. And now you're at the point where reality may be setting in. Now, how are we gonna pay for, the, for all this? So it's a, it's a part of the process, um, certainly not one of, the, one of the better parts of the process, but uh, it's great that you're here, and hopefully we can give you some assistance as to how to navigate this part uh, of the process. Now, not only being uh, in the guidance business, but I'm also the parent of a freshman high school student. So after I turn it over to to Dion, I'm going to sit down like you, and I'm going to take notes. I'm going to I'm going to go go on your side. So without more to say, I'm going to introduce Miss Dion Hallback, who comes to us from the College of New Jersey. Um, she is in the Student Financial Aid Office. Um, she brought us uh, DVDs. So if you have not. Um, received one, you could grab one afterwards. Um, her presentation is going to go for 45 minutes to an hour, and I'm sure at a presentation like this, you're going to have questions. There'll be time for questions at the conclusion of her talk. Thanks for coming out, Ms. Hallback. Good evening and welcome again. My name is Dion Hallback. I'm an Associate Director at the College of New Jersey in the Financial Aid Office. So it's a pleasure for me to talk to you about financial aid. It's not the most exciting topic, but it's a very important topic. So the presentation will last about an hour. Um, I will cover a variety of information regarding the types of financial aid, how to apply, and share some personal experiences that I've encountered working with families. So let's begin. The mission. This presentation tonight is actually sponsored by HESA. It's the state agency in New Jersey. It's the Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. So I'm not presenting, per se, TCNJ information, but general financial aid information that everyone can use. The goals of the financial aid office, regardless of what type of school a student attends, whether it's a public, a two-year school, or private school, our main goal is to help families, um, what I like to call, develop a plan of action. How are they going to pay for a college, not just the first year, but the four years? Sources of aid and types of financial aid. Depending upon the source of aid determines the type of financial aid a student receives. So the first one you see is federal. Federal covers everything that's listed under types. When a student applies for federal aid, they're applying for grants, scholarships, loans, and work opportunities. Now the state of New Jersey also offers aid. So when you're applying for financial aid, the state of New Jersey offers grants, scholarships, and they also have a loan division. The next, the college or university, many colleges, of course, offer scholarships. But depending upon the type of college or university, some may also offer grants, and some may have their own private loans that they offer students. And then outside organizations, that's when you're looking mostly at your private outside scholarships. Types of aid, gift aid or grants. That's the one everyone comes to my office and say, I need grant money, Ms. Dion. How can I get grant money? So I want to talk about the federal government. The first one is the Pell Grant. That's the largest grant program that the federal government offers. Now, as you can see, the max award this year is $5,645. That's the annual amount. That means it's usually divided between the fall semester and the spring semester. So that ranges from zero, and then that's the max award. And we're being told that next year is being proposed that it may go up to $5,710. Typically, we won't learn that mm, probably until March or April. We'll learn the new figures for next year. 
The next grant program is SEOG, it's the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant Program. This grant program is awarded to students who have need, okay? So most colleges receive a certain amount of money for this particular grant from the federal government, and then they award this to the neediest students on campus as defined by the financial aid and the cost of attendance. So if a student is automatically awarded, they may see the SEOG um, in their award letter. The one thing I do want to note about SEOG, it says $4,000. However, the SEOG grant and some others I'll explain is what we like to call campus-based aid. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that term. Campus-based means that the college determines how much they're going to award to that student. So even though the federal government says the max is 4,000, if a school's allocation is small, they may decide to divvy it up and say maybe award $1,000 so they can spread out the amount to a larger number of students. The next one is the TEACH grant. Does anyone in here want to become a teacher or if you know your child wants to become a teacher, thinking about becoming a teacher? Okay. The TEACH grant max is $3,760. The one thing I want to talk to you about the TEACH grant briefly is that the TEACH grant um, is what we like to call it also a loan, even though it's a grant. So typically, schools have to agree to participate to even award the TEACH grant. So if you're looking at schools, you want to become a teacher, always ask the financial aid office, do you participate in the TEACH grant program? Okay? Students have to sign a promissory note agreeing that after they teach, they have to work in a certain area and in a certain discipline. And then additionally, the one thing that I don't like about this, typically when you're young, I want to become a teacher. Your senior year, oh, I don't want to teach. If you receive this grant all four years and don't teach, it becomes a loan. Okay, so potentially after that four years, if you received it, now you're looking at that grant now turning into a federal loan, and then you have to pay the government back that loan, plus all the interest that was accruing at that time, even though you didn't receive it as a loan. So I just want to make that disclaimer for anyone who is thinking about becoming a teacher or if you think your child wants to become a teacher. The next type of aid, the state aid from New Jersey, is the TAG grant program. The TAG grant program is the most generous program that the state of New Jersey offers. And as you can see, um, it says three, $302 million. Actually, for this year, they're anticipating awarding almost $340 million. So as you can see, it's a very generous program. And the TAG grant program is automatically offered to students when they file the FAFSA if they've listed a New Jersey school first on the FAFSA. So students are automatically being considered for the TAG grant program. One thing also about the TAG grant program, it differs depending upon the type of school a student attends. So if a student attends a private school versus a public school, say if they go to Montclair or TCNJ or Rutgers, their amount of that TAG grant program may differ. And the reason why is each school costs different. So the state of New Jersey allocates a certain amount of money for each school. So if you student receives an award letter and they see the TAG grant, but the amount varies, that is the reason why. The next grant program for the state is the EOF Educational Opportunity Grant Program. This grant program is from students who are from disadvantaged backgrounds. So what happens on admissions application, there's a question for students. Are you interested in the EOF program? And for this particular program, students must have a certain number in their household and the family household can't exceed a certain dollar value. So if a student selects they want to be considered for this program, their applications are pulled and then they see if they meet the specific state guidelines and then at that point additional information and a review is conducted. But if you were to Google Education Opportunity Fund, it's a whole state department dedicated to this program and you can see what those income guidelines are to see if you may fit into that. The next one is the Governor's Urban Scholarship. This scholarship is from students who rank in the top 5% of their um, high school class, but the thing about this particular scholarship, they must maintain a 3.0 at the end of their junior year, okay? So a lot of scholarships may look at the senior year. This one looks at the junior year. Also for state scholarship, there's New Jersey Stars. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of NJ Stars. 
A little bit, okay. NJ Stars is for students who want to go to a community college, okay? So for NJ Stars, students who graduate in the top 15% of their high school graduating class, they must complete a rigorous um, high school course of study, use a lot of AP classes, and then you have to meet some other criteria. But if you receive NJ Stars, you're receiving tuition free at a community college. That's what that program is about. And then once you graduate, say, from Mercer County or Burlington, wherever that student attends, if they then transfer to a four-year university and then they meet certain criteria, they may, may be considered for New Jersey Stars too. And then for New Jersey Stars too, they must have earned an associate's degree and graduate with a 3.25 GPA. And then at that four-year university, they're able to receive $2,500 annually. So this is a good way if someone is not sure what school they want to go to a four year, they want to start off at a community college and they meet some of these criteria, they may be considered for a New Jersey Stars scholarship. Um, the next day scholarship is the Governor's and Industry Vocational Scholarship for Women and Minorities. This basically is for anyone that wants to pursue a non-degree, um, so like a certificate program. So this is a fairly new program. Um, and then some of the criteria is listed here, and it's for women and for minorities. Institutional grants. Factors that may influence institutional aid. And this is where at the beginning I talked about, in addition to scholarships, a lot of institutions may also offer grants. And as we know, they may look at a variety of things such as academics, SATs, activities, talent, athletic ability. There is a note. I want to caution that athletic awards are only offered with Division I and Division II schools. So if anyone's an athlete, you need to make sure that you're aware of that when you're applying to colleges. And then private outside scholarship, that's where you say your Coca-Cola, your Walmart, your Target. So those are those type of scholarships. And then typically what I tell students, especially when they come into my office, I always tease them. I say, well, you all on Facebook and Twitter and all this other social media, take a few minutes, an hour a day or whatever, and look for private scholarships. That could be the difference between you having to ask your parents for money or charge a book. I've seen students come into our college sometimes as a freshman with one scholarship, I've seen some come in with 10. I'm not sure where they're finding the money, but these students are actually taking the time to research private scholarships and apply. Another um, tip I can also give, I know a lot of high schools may have award nights. You may want to look at that awards book from the previous years and see what scholarships were offered. Ask the guidance counselor, you know, are you receiving scholarships? So there's money out there to be um, received for private scholarships. Basically, it's a matter of time for students taking the time to research them. Now we're moving into self-help loans and shortfall solutions. The first one is monthly payment plans offered by the college. Mainly all colleges offer some type of payment plan. So typically when a student comes into my office and we look at what their basic award is, this is when I then go into, okay, now you have a balance. Here are some other ways you can meet that gap that you need to pay. So monthly payment plans are offered. I know at the College of New Jersey, we offer the tuition pay plan by Sally May. And most of them are basically the same. You pay over a series of months, usually like 10 months is a nominal fee. And so this is another way, if you can't afford to take out a loan or you want to take out everything in a loan, you ask the parent, what can you afford to pay? A lot of people are really cautious about taking out a lot of loans to go to school. And some say, well, I know I can pay $500 a month or $100 a month. So we sit down and calculate, well, what can you pay a month? You may want to consider a payment plan as a viable alternative. Instead of cashing out a large lump sum, say, in the fall semester, you could spread those payments out over a series of months. So you may want to look at a payment plan as a viable alternative. The next um, self-help loan is the Federal Perkins Loan. As you can see, it's a 5% interest rate. This is a federal loan. This is also what we call a campus-based loan, which again means the federal government allocates a certain amount to, students, to schools, and the schools determine how it's awarded, okay? Typically, this is awarded to students who have need on the FAFSA, and a lot of times, the Perkins loan money runs out during the first run of the financial aid awarding cycle. That's why I always caution students, make sure you file on time so if you are eligible, hopefully you may receive some Perkins dollars if you're interested. 
The Federal Direct Loan Program, this is the most popular loan program that the federal government offers. And as you can see, it's two different types listed. We have the subsidized Stafford loan, 3,500 need based, that's for a first year student. And then we have an unsubsidized Stafford loan, $2,000 additional. So basically what the difference is, a subsidized Stafford loan means the federal government will pay the interest for the student while they're in school. The unsubsidized means that even though the students don't have to pay any principal, they will be billed on a quarterly basis for those interest payments. Now they do have the option to opt out if they don't want to pay it or mom and dad can't pay it, but then that interest will accumulate for all four years or however many years they haven't paid it. Okay? Now the dollar value, I want to stay here for a little bit. So as a first year student, regardless of how much money anyone makes, all first year students will be offered a total of 5,500. So if a student has some need when they fill out that FAFSA form, they may receive some in the subsidized and they may receive some in unsubsidized. Okay, that's how it's broken down. Now, if I made a million dollars, I'm not gonna have any need, so therefore my child will receive this Stafford loan um, for 5,500 in the unsubsidized. So this one varies depending upon the need and the application. But another thing I want to point out is that each year a student files the FAFSA, the first year the max they can receive is 5,500. The second year it increases to 6,500. And then the third and fourth year it maxes out at $7,500. Okay? The federal direct undergraduate staff loans also are now at 3.86. And then we also have an origination fee. So when the money is actually dispersed to pay the student account, the government takes a fee, and that's that particular fee. So it's always less when it goes to pay the bill. And then actually we just informed that the origination fee is now currently 1.072. So last year, the subsidized was 3.86. The unsubsidized was actually supposed to go up to 6.86 interest rate. So luckily it went down, we're hoping that they both will stay the same for next year. Next I wanna move into NJ Class Supplemental Loan Program. This program is offered by the state of New Jersey. So say you still have a balance that you have to pay after you've been awarded, say, any federal aid, any state aid. And now some families may have to look into private loans. And the state of New Jersey has a loan program called the New Jersey um, NJ class program. This is a fixed rate loan and it has varying repayment options. So if you were to go to their website, it's really simple. They break everything down for you and you can also estimate your payments. So they have interest rates ranging from 5.49 to 8.05. And what that means is that the first one is 5.49. So if you were to log on to their website, that would basically tell you you have 10 years to pay that back at the 5.49 interest rate and then you're paying principal and interest on a monthly basis. So usually I say parents, that's another monthly bill that you can expect if you choose that option. Some parents say, that doesn't work for me, what else do they offer? Then you wanna go into option two, which is between the two, and if, I think it's 6.07. That particular option for option two, you have 15 years to pay that loan back. However, they give you two options. You can opt to pay principal and interest, at that six point interest rate for 15 years, or you can opt to pay only interest. You still get 15 years, the same interest rate, okay? And then if that doesn't work, they offer a third option, and that's the highest interest rate. That's the 8.05. That means you say, I really can't afford to pay anything at this time, so that I wanna defer principal and interest until my son or daughter graduates, okay? So that's how that particular loan program works. So if you were to go to the, uh, or even, I think if you type in njclass.org or HESA, it explains everything there for you. This one also has an option of 3% fit. This application typically opens up around June or July. So if you're a senior, or your parent, your child's a senior, you think you may be interested, look at this website around June or July and they'll have the new rates posted. Now, the first two options actually decreased from last year. The last one at 8.05, the full deferment, that stayed the same. So just some information for you. The next loan is the Federal PLUS Loan Program. 
The current interest rate is 6.41, and the origination fee is 4.204. This one I don't like for that particular reason, and I'll let you know why. It has the same terms as the New Jersey class option one. So for the plus loan, it gives you 10 years, same as NJ class. However, the plus loan interest rate, as you can see, is 6.41 versus the NJ class option one is 5.49. So right there, you already have a lower interest rate. Secondly, the federal government for the PLUS loan, their fee is 4%. So when that money disperses to pay the account, it's going to be 4% less versus the NJ class option one is 3%. So if you were to compare the two, NJ class may be a better option. But we do have families take the PLUS loan for whatever reason, and that's their prerogative. But that's how I like to compare the loans when students come into my office. Now, one thing I do like about the PLUS loan program is that if a parent is denied the PLUS loan program, they won't deny the student. So all alternative um, loans, they will check your credit history, your credit score, et cetera. But if I apply and I'm denied, then they won't tell my student no. So as a first or second year student, if a parent is denied, they're awarded an additional $4,000 of the Stafford loan program, okay? So as a first year student, all students are automatically being offered $5,500. So if a, student, a parent fills out the PLUS loan and they're denied, that student gets an additional $4,000. So a lot of parents come in and fill it out anyway just to see what the options are. If they're denied, we automatically award that student. If a parent um, applies and the student is a junior or senior and they're denied, the student receives an additional $5,000 of unsubsidized funds. So that's the one thing I do like about the PLUS loan program. And the last one is institutional or private loans. These are basically your Wells Fargo, Sally Mae, um, Citibank, so any bank loan. Everyone's basically in the, loan in the loan business. So I know even on our websites and many schools' websites, they have a listing of all private loans. And then you can go out and apply for those private loans and you can compare the difference between them. Okay, the first application I'm going to talk about is the CSS profile. Now this profile, why is it required? It provides additional information than the FAFSA. It asks for probably non-custodial parent information, home equity, so it really takes a look at what your finances are. Who requires it? Typically schools with large endowment funds who have a lot of money they're trying to award, they may require the CSS profile. So your best bet is to ask the school that you're applying to, do you require this particular form? And what they're trying to do is to make sure they're awarding their personal dollars to students who need it or whatever their criteria may be. Now when families file, it's available um, now, October 1st, 2013, but this actually has a fee. So it costs $25 for the first college and then $16 for each additional college. Now we're going to move into the FAFSA, which is the widely known application. The FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. So submit the free application for federal student aid. It says prior to the school's earliest deadline, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Most schools have deadlines, and typically when they say priority deadlines, especially for incoming freshmen, what that means is if you want to receive an estimated award letter before that May 1st date when students have to decide, you want to apply by that school's priority date. That way, your FAFSA is in the system, they can award you whatever age you may be eligible for and give you an estimate so you can make an accurate comparison of different awards. Um, and then the last bullet, be sure to answer all optional questions on the FAFSA like gender. Why gender? Male students must sign up for selective service, it's not an option. So if they don't sign up for selective service or check that on the FAFSA, their FAFSA is automatically rejected and it's just a, a stopping point. Yes? Is all this on the desk? Or should... Some is and some isn't. <laughs> Basically, most of the, the presentation is not on the FAFSA, but it gives you the same information. I'm just giving you little tidbits that you may not have. Um, and then driver's license. Driver's license is required because many states want to confirm that when they're giving out state aid, those students are resident of New Jersey. So it's a double check for them. 
The FAFSA collects student families' personal and financial information to calculate what we call an expected family contribution. So when you file the FAFSA at the conclusion of the FAFSA, it'll say your expected family contribution is X. The way I like to explain that is the um, EFC, as we call it, is an index number. So that number is used in conjunction with how much the college costs to determine if a student may qualify for any grant dollars or any subsidized loans. And you file the FAFSA electronically. There's the website. It's always available every January 1. So every January 1, the new FAFSA is available for students to file. Now, I'm not saying on New Year's Eve you have to file a FAFSA, but it's available that next day. Student and parent must obtain a PIN number. That's going to be your electronic signature. So when you finish completing the FAFSA, it will ask you to enter your PIN number. So typically what we um, encourage students and families to do, even before you file the FAFSA, and there's a, a slide I'm going to show you, sign up for your PIN number. By the time you complete the FAFSA, you have your PIN and you can sign it. If you forget, you have to then download the sheet, mail it in. It's much simpler if you have a PIN number. And also for the FAFSA, you want to use estimated income or actual prior tax data. So for anyone that's a senior, parents, you will need, and students if they've worked, their 2013 income information. Now, I told you it's available January 1, so you probably think, well, how do I file if I don't have my tax return if you file tax or haven't done so? What a lot of people do, if they're really anxious, they can estimate. And you can use your two years ago information, fill out the form. Once you file your taxes, you can go back and update your information. Okay? So that's what some families do if they just want to get it into the pipeline. And then also you can use what we have now is the IRS data retrieval tool. This is actually a very good tool, and I'll tell you the reason why. If you file your taxes, two weeks after you file your taxes, you can log in to complete your FAFSA. And then when you get to the income portion, there's an extra series of questions. If you have the option to download your tax information onto your FAFSA. If you still file your FAFSA via paper, you have to wait six to eight weeks to use this option. So a box will open up and then the IRS will automatically populate your income onto the FAFSA. The reason why it's a good thing is because typically families sit there with their tax return, they try to figure out what number they want, what line they want, and fill out the FAFSA. That's how a lot of mistakes happen. But another good reason why is the federal government basically, I think, has this as an audit to try to make sure people are telling the truth. So anyone that uses this IRS data retrieval tool, you will not be selected for a process called verification. So what happens when you file your FAFSA, the government um, selects families at random. And then you may receive a letter, say, from the institution saying, I need you to submit your tax return. I need you to submit your W-2s. If you use this tool, you will not be selected for that process because they basically confirm that what you have on the FAFSA is what you reported. So if you're not familiar with the FAFSA, this is what it looks like for this year. It usually changes colors every year. And then this here is the PIN website. So you can even go home tonight and apply for a PIN number, just have it handy. Because um, in addition to signing for your FAFSA, you also need the PIN number for students. The students, if they take out that federal staffer loan, they have to sign a promissory note agreeing to pay back the loan, and they're going to ask them for that PIN number. And so the PIN number can be used all four years. And if a parent has more than one child in school, you only need one PIN number. OK, so if you already have a child in school and you file the FAFSA, you can use that same PIN number. Yes, ma'am? It was regarding that, whether the older children. Yes. Okay. Yep. And even if they're done school, you still use the same PIN You can log into this site and see. If you forget, it'll send you some information. It still may exist, or so you can change it. Yes. How do you get access to the, the, is that a link on the FAFSA website? No, it's a separate um, website. So if you go to www.pen.ed.gov, that's OK. Yep, you go right there. OK, some major changes actually for next year's FAFSA I want to point out to you. Um, it says, if you have a Social Security number, but you are not a US citizen or eligible non-citizen, you should still complete the FAFSA because you may be eligible for state aid or college aid. 
You, may, you won't be receiving any federal aid. However, students in this category, they may receive aid from the college or from the state. And then the bullet two talks about, they're changing some lingo on the FAFSA, so they're revising single to never married, and then they're adding a new response, unmarried and both parents living together. And the reason why we think they changed that question is typically if a student's parents weren't married, they may choose either parent's income to use on the FAFSA. But now you have to use both regardless if they're married or not. So that's what that question we believe is alluding to. Some general highlighted eligibility requirements must have a valid social security number, must be enrolled into a program, US citizen, and again, males must register with selective service. Uh, so keep some key components of the FAFSA, um, student's last name, social security number, again, all applicants must indicate their gender. Students, if any students work and they have to file a tax return, they too must complete and submit their income information. Some families don't realize that, but you still have to include that. And students too can use the IRS data retrieval. Um, student status, independent versus dependent, that's where it gets a little tricky. On the FAFSA, there's a series of about, I think, eight questions. They ask you your age, like if you're under 24, if you're married, if you have a child, if you're homeless, ward the court. Those, that set of questions is determining that student status, if they're an independent student or a dependent student. So anyone that's deemed a dependent student, they must have their parents' um, FAFSA information or income information, otherwise they can't continue the form. And then parents' demographics, the same information. Household number, size, and college, um, parents' assets, uh, college choice. I want to talk about this one again. It says list of New Jersey college first. And the reason why HESA has this on the, app, on the slide is because when you get to the end of the FAFSA and it says list of colleges you want to attend, then you can select up to 10. If you select, say, UPenn, you're going to receive a letter from New Jersey saying you aren't eligible for the tuition A grant because you are attending UPenn. So I would encourage all students, regardless if you want to stay in school in Jersey or not, you know, I want to move away from my mom and dad, always list the New Jersey school first, or at least the one you think you want to go to. And the reason why is that when you file the FAFSA, HESA, the state of New Jersey, receives all your information. They will review your information to see if you qualify for that grant from New Jersey. Okay? So that's important. A lot of students don't realize that. But if you forget and you receive that letter, at the bottom you have the option to change it. But it makes it a lot easier up front if you know what school you think you want to go to. Or even if you change your mind, you can log into their website and say, I don't want to go to TCNJ, I want to go to Rutgers. And then they'll recalculate your eligibility to determine how much aid you may receive um, via the TAG grant program. Yes? Is there any kind of a negative aspect to that? If Kids are applying to colleges out of state and applying to federal aid? No, really, it's just a listing, and I didn't know that when I was in school either. <laughs> it's just a listing what college you want to go to. But for New Jersey, they look at that to see what school you're interested in. That's why they have on the slide listed first. I saw another hand? Yes. Uh, the exact same question. So if, if you have two schools you're choosing between one in Jersey and one in Pennsylvania, if the Pennsylvania school, if it was listed first, would not get notified. No, all, all 10 schools are going to receive the FAFSA information. So if you list UPenn, TCNJ, all the 10 schools automatically are going to receive your FAFSA information. It's only New Jersey that cares which one's first? Correct. So when you file the FAFSA, if, you, if your student lists, say, five schools, all five schools are going to receive that FAFSA information. They're going to start to work on your estimated award letter and say, okay, from, say from Rutgers, if you come here, you'll receive this amount if you go to TCNJ, et cetera. But New Jersey, when they're evaluating who's eligible for the TAG grant program, they're looking to see who's in that top spot. Okay? So it really doesn't, all of them are going to receive the information, but just for New Jersey, they look at that first slot. Did I confuse you? No? Okay, yes. Does it make a difference which New Jersey school you put at the top spot? It doesn't. I would recommend your top New Jersey school. Because <laughs> like I said, even if, say, if you put, say, TCNJ, 
and you say, you know what, you receive in March, I don't want to go to TCNJ now. You can always change it, and then they'll recalculate your eligibility, say, from Montclair for Rutgers. So, yeah. It's just that up front, if you think you know, I would just encourage you to put a New Jersey school first and the top school that you think you want to attend. I have students all the time come in and they're inquiring about TAG and I look in the system, I say, oh, you put Montclair, I can go in and change it for them, but it's easier up front for the family. And it doesn't matter private or public college in New Jersey? No, it does not. Okay. Yes? So you're just saying that when we're looking at schools outside of New Jersey, you're just saying just Case, just in case, and I'll give you an example. I was supposed to go to school in North Carolina. My mother got sick. So luckily I put a New Jersey school first because then I was able to look to say, oh, if I go to Rutgers, I may get additional money to help me stay in state. So that's why. So yeah, just as a backup. All right, that's good. Common mistakes made on the FAFSA. Make sure the student indicates their name exactly how it appears on their SSS card. So if their name is Susan, don't put Sue. Okay, they check that information also. Parent section versus the student section. This is a funny one. I have a story. Family, um, she's actually a first year student now at TCNJ. And they came in, they were frantic. You know, only got the Stafford Loan Program. We're curious why we didn't get anything else. So I log into the system, I look at the FAFSA. And then I asked the student, I said, well, did you work during the summer? She said, yeah, I worked. And I said, well, you must have had a pretty good job because you listed you made $160,000. Then the family started freaking out. Well, who followed the FAFSA? Who so basically they realized that what they did, they put the parents' information in the student section. And again, they were manually typing it in. I said, well, if you did the IRS data retrieval, it automatically downloads for you. So I basically had to do a recalculation for them. So things like that happen. Okay, so that's why it's important to make sure you're in the right section if you are manually entering in the information. Number of people in household, taxes paid versus taxes withheld, and then actually the parent and student assets. Zero is a number, okay? So if you don't have any assets, put zero. You never want to leave anything to the imagination, especially sometimes if you have a private school and they're looking to see how they're going to award their own institutional dollars, they may wonder why. But then they also had the CSS profile form, but just make sure you fill it out completely. And, yeah, that's good. Excuse me. Yes. Um, if, you're, if you have a 529 for your student, is that considered your student's asset? Is it in your name or the student's name? It's in our name, right? Right, then it's an asset yeah. for you. It's an asset for the parent right. for the student. Correct. Okay. How to be considered for state aid. Again, you have to complete the FAFSA if you want to be considered for aid from New Jersey. Again, list New Jersey school first. Um, uh, at the last bullet, click the link and complete the additional New Jersey state questions. I think there's a slide coming up soon. But when you complete the FAFSA again, at the end, you think you're done. There's a little question that says optional state application. You want to complete that. It does say optional because not all states award state aid to their New Jersey students. But New Jersey does. But New Jersey asks four additional questions to determine if you're eligible. So a lot of times people miss it because you think you're done. You click out, oh, I've complete the FAFSA. But if you miss that, they will contact you via mail and ask you to complete that information. They send you two hard copy letters to your home. And if you miss those deadlines, they'll send you a letter saying that student is ineligible for aid from New Jersey. And here it is. So right there in that optional feature, it says start your state application, click here. Just make sure your pop-up blockers are off on your computer. And once you click that, another window will open and take you directly to the New Jersey site. And then I think they ask you for four pieces of information. Complete the information and then you're done. Cost of attendance. Cost of attendance usually freaks sometimes families out when they're looking and exploring colleges. They say, oh, what's the cost of the college? But I want to break this down a little bit for you to give you, um, help you out a little bit. Tuition and fees, room and board, and the third bullet, book supplies, equipment, transportation, and miscellaneous. These are the major types that are listed in the cost of attendance, okay? The optional ones are loan fees, study abroad, and the others. And the way I like to explain this is 
The first one, tuition and fees and room and board. That's what we consider at my college is your direct cost. A lot of families say, what's the bill going to be in, 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 in August? Okay, what am I going to have to pay? They're um, interested in the tuition and fees and if the student's living on campus, the room and board. Okay, that may be say $10,000. Okay, but when you're evaluating costs of attendance, schools also include the books, supplies, and transportation. So that cost of that school may be 30000 but you may only be billed, say, for that first two. That's your, indir your direct cost. So when you're evaluating the cost of the college and you're really concerned of what am I going to have to pay, you want to look at what are the tuition and fees, and if the student's living on campus, the room and board. Okay? Of course, you have to pay for books and everything else, but your tuition bill is what I'm sure most of you are concerned about. Okay? So when you're evaluating that cost of attendance, you may see a large number, you may want to dig a little deeper. Okay? Many schools have on their um, website a tuition and fee list, or call them up and say, what, what does a, a typical freshman pay for tuition and fees and housing? And then that will give you a better idea of what that particular school is really costing you out of pocket. What is the family expected contribution? Basis of financial aid package. EFC is determined again by the federal formula. And basically, like I said, I like to say it's an index, but they're guidelines that the colleges use in conjunction with the other rules and regulations to award the grants and subsidized aid. So the definition of need, because I talked about need, or I've said need a little bit during the presentation, but the cost of attendance, again, is variable. So if you go to Princeton, it's much higher versus if you go to a state school than a two-year school. But that EFC number is constant. So regardless of what school that student is attending, that EFC is never going to change. So when the school is evaluating and awarding aid, basically looking at the cost of attendance, the EFC, and then the difference is the need. That's how schools are awarding financial aid to needy students. To determine if you have any type of need. Yes? Each college determines the EFC? No, when you file the FAFSA, the FAFSA determines your EFC, so the federal government does. It's a federal methodology, some quirky formula. So everything that you are listing on the FAFSA, they're taking that into consideration to come up with this EFC number. The shopping sheet. This is fairly new. I'm not sure. Has anyone heard of the shopping sheet? No? Okay. The federal government is mandating all schools have a shopping sheet. Basically, it's standardizing award letters. They felt that when families are going through the college process, of course, it's very confusing, especially financial aid. And so you may receive different types of awards from different schools. So they're mandating that colleges offer some type of shopping sheet that has basically the same information on it. And that shopping sheet should give you how much it costs, the type of awards, grants, but then also on the left, the other, uh, I guess, teal color, some schools may also offer the graduation rate. Some families may be interested in, you know, are students staying here for four years, for five years? They may also offer the loan default rate, and then they may say, well, are students paying those loans back at that institution? So they, they thought it was a good idea to standardize some information so when you're sitting down and evaluating all your award letters, you're having apples to apples and not oranges to apples. The net price calculator, this also I think is about in the second or third year. This is what we like to call buyer beware. Because if you go out to many schools, they may have a calculator on their website. You enter in, say, what your income is, ask some specific questions. And then it spits out some information and says, well, if you come here, you may be eligible for a grant and this amount. But the thing about the net price calculator, schools have to update that information on the back end every year. They have to update their tuition and fees, how much the school costs, how much the awards they're giving out. So schools don't update that at a certain time. You may be looking at information that's one to two years old. Okay? So I wouldn't tell you not to use it, but just know that when you're using the calculators, you may just want to inquire how um, current is the information that you're receiving. Caution, please do not pay anyone to file the FAFSA. It is a free form. Um, and also, you don't want to go to FAFSA.com. They will charge you, I think it's $25. You want to make sure you go to FAFSA.gov. 
I had a family come in and a mom was freaking out. You don't have my FAFSA? And they were actually a freshman trying to determine how much aid they had. And then when she, I finally probed her for more and more questions, I said, well, you went to the wrong site. So I didn't have the information. So you want to make sure you want to go to FAFSA.gov. And then if you really have any questions, you can always contact me, even though if you don't come to TCNJ, I have no problems helping you out. Um, you can even go to the school that you may want to attend. And then also HESA offers um, College Goal Sunday. Typically, it's in February. I think they're extending it out. So what that means is in New Jersey, there are sites, sometimes at high schools or even at colleges, where you can go receive a financial aid presentation, and then you can go to a computer lab, and then there's professionals like myself that will help you fill out the facts or answer any questions that you may have. Yes? Are they still expecting that the student have, or should the student have as little assets as possible? That's a very good question. When you follow the FAFSA, the federal government looks at the student side more harshly than the parents. So there's an allowances that they make basically for income for both the student and the parent. But if a student, say, has assets of, say, $20,000, $30,000, they are combining the student and the parents to come up with that EFC. But if the student has more, ass a lot of assets, they're going to weight that heavily. And the reason why, the thinking is they're young, they can use that money to pay for college, not for, you know, when they're 40 or 50. So that's what it, it is weighted. So we have until the end of the year to get rid of But if they, yes and no. If they file a tax return, they say they have interest or income or dividends, that's when we look to determine if you don't have anything in assets, we're going to call you and say, now I need your statement so I can see exactly how much they received. So, yeah. <laughs> the financial aid cycle. So, January to March, this is when you complete the FAFSA. Now, by March or May, if you haven't received anything from any financial aid office, you just start to panic and start to call them and say, I don't have an estimated award letter, you know, can you check my status? And it could be a um, number of reasons why. Maybe you didn't sign the FAFSA. Maybe the male student was rejected for selective service. It could be a number of things, okay? But just reach out to the school if you haven't heard anything from them by this time frame. And then June and July, most schools, um, the first um, fall semester bill is due. Yes? You keep bringing up uh, selective service. My son will turn 18 in September. So he doesn't sign up for selective service until after this whole process goes through. Is that going to present the complication? It should not, because when he puts in his birth date, they all know that. They also check selective service, too. Right. So where do you go from here? Basically, you want to review any admissions information that you're um, evaluating, check your financial aid materials, investigate research why you're here today. Um, check all deadlines. Like I said, if you're going to, say, a highly selective school, you want to also check to see if they require the CSS profile application. Um, complete the FAFSA. And then in green, it talks about the deadlines. Basically, what that's saying is for tag renewal students, continuing students, they actually have until June 1st. Their FAFSA must be on file by June 1st to be considered. And then all other applicants, it says October 1st. But if you're a freshman, you're not going to wait until October to file your FAFSA. You want to file it early. But for some people, they may say, you know what, I'm not filing that FAFSA. We're not going to receive anything. We'll just pay. Something may happen, but they, they haven't then until October 1st to file the FAFSA. That's why that deadline is so late. Yes? Um, I have received an email from one of my daughter's schools from the CSS mm -hmm. profile. Um, and I have, obviously haven't done any taxes or anything like that. Is that just like an estimate? I believe it is an estimate, right, because even with the FAFSA, um, if you go in in January, you're not going to have your tax return, so you can estimate your information and then update it when you file your tax return. But yeah, you can even call the school and just verify that. Okay, so if the information has changed, from, you know, dramatically has changed. Then your award will probably change, depending upon at that school. Or it may not, so yeah. Yes? The difference between CSS and the FAFSA, the FAFSA is federal CSS is, is you, private that some schools subscribe It's to. private, right. Only 400 schools nationwide use the CSS profile. Which, can you, can you generalize the, the, the major universities, say, you know, the Rutgers, the Princeton's, the TCNJs, do they 
deal with CSS? No, actually we don't. Let me see. I think I have. And you can also take a look. I have a listing actually here with the CSS profile. It gives you all the schools here. So if you want to take a look at it after I'm done, you can check it out. So if, you know, my son has four schools and none of those appear on the list and I can just forget about it. You can forget about it. Yeah, the CSS profile is for schools who have a lot of money. So they say, you know, I have a large endowment funds. I want to award this money, you know, as best as possible. And then they determine their criteria. They're not looking at any FAFSA data. So they look, that's what it's for. But, but, um, so, but there are schools that do have a large endowment that could choose to simply use the FAFSA? Because it seems like the CSS information is all contained in the FAFSA. It's not. Because the CSS profile may ask you the equity on your house, FAFSA doesn't ask that. They may ask you, you know, what kind of car you drive. So they really dig deep into, you know, your financial situation. Where the FAFSA is asking you for your adjusted gross income, your taxes paid, these are the main things. How many are in your household? How many are going to college? Your assets and investments. Those are like the major, major financial. Whereas the CSS profile is really asking you for specific, detailed financial information. So that's the difference. What the FAFSA does, um, for each application that's filed, they have allowances. So even like if you put, say you made $100,000, they're now counting that 400. They may be counting, um, accounting a certain allowance of that. They ask the age of the parent because they take allowances for say if you're about to retire, you may have retirement income. So even though it's not asked on the FAFSA, the government has embedded in their methodology different allowances to account for things like that, but it's not outright. But someone may have, someone may have been given their first home by their parents and they may have a minimal mortgage where someone else might have bought a house later in life and have a huge mortgage. I mean, but there's no way to... No, unfortunately not. Yeah, that gets me. So you're saying that CSS is more specific. Is it better for me to wait until I do my, my FAFSA to complete that profile? I would ask the school that you're, um, you, um, if the school requires it. I'm not sure if they're looking at the CSS profile now to start um, looking at, to awarding aid. A lot of private institutions are different. So they may begin to award aid when they send acceptance packages. When they start to extend their acceptance packages out, they may include information or awards about their specific institutional aid. So I would really talk to them about to say, you know, should I file it now so you have an idea, or should I wait until I have additional information? So my question is, my information that I give them is not going to be accurate, because I really don't know. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it going to hurt her when she applies for her FAFSA? If I complete this profile now, it's not accurate, and the FAFSA is more accurate, because I have my taxes done at that point, is it going to mess her up? It may not mess her up again because the FAFSA, you're only looking at the grant dollars and the loan dollars, where you may file the FAFSA and then you file the CSS profile and they may say, oh, she has additional need, we can offer her these grant dollars. So, I mean, it's a catch-22, but I really talk to the school that you're applying, you're applying for to ask them, you know, what they suggest. Yeah, if you, if you have a really concern, big concern about that. Yes. But what is the virtue then of fulfilling the CSS out that early? If the award letter, letters don't come out until after the FAFSA deadline, um, is there really a benefit to, to filling out your CSS profile in December and then your FAFSA in February? If your income's about the same, you may want to fill it out again, but... It's not. I mean, it, it seems like no one's going to look at, or the schools aren't going to look at the CSS profile until the FAFSA deadline because it's not like they're going to give you an award letter in January because uh, you said the award letters come out March, April, May. Well, I'm not saying all schools don't. So that's why I'm encouraging you really to check with the school that you're going to. So I would really do that with the CSS profile. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. With the FAFSA, how does it work if you have divorced parents? Do they both fill out a section or do they get the question is divorced parents. The student that the parent lives with 50% of the time, or they're giving more 50% of the support, that's who the student should list on the FAFSA, that parent. So if the student is living with you, say, for all 12, um, 12 months for that prior year, then they should use your income on the form. Are there, well, if you want to get a sense of what the package is going to be, you know, in advance, and you don't want to wait till you know, after you've applied to all the colleges, like to have an idea before, is there a FAFSA calculator? Is there, I mean, 
Well, yeah, that's why you would go out to that net price calculator on the school's website, and you can put in your information, and then it will tell you basically what you may be eligible for. So that's what those calculators are out there for. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to pass, uh, you know, I, I, I gather from your slides that FAFSA is going to come up with an amount that pretty much everybody uses that amount as your need. You say it again. I'm sorry. On one of your slides, you said there's a calculation for what the student's need is. And right. It's not going to vary from college to college. That's FAFSA. That's, that's computing that now. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So how can you get that number? Some of, the, some of the FAFSA elements are embedded in those calculators. Yeah. That's why it's giving you an estimate. Okay. Should, should you mention the FAFSA forecaster to present? Um, there also is a FAFSA forecaster that I can talk about. Let me just finish the presentation that I can answer more specific questions. We're, we're almost done. Okay, other resources. We talked about outside scholarships, campus payment plans, also campus employment. A lot of students may also um, be awarded work study. So if a student wants to work on campus and they receive work study, they can work. That money is not deducted from the bill per se, but it's money in their pockets for living expenses. And if they don't receive work study, most schools offer on-campus jobs for students. And then specialized campus opportunities. This is where after the student um, continues their first year, if the student really wants to inquire about ways to reduce the bill, sometimes depending upon the schools they go to, if they work in residence or hall monitors, they may receive reduced housing, free housing. Um, student ambassadors, I'm sure everyone's been on the college tour, given by a student, those students are paid. So different th ways that you can, um, or your student can possibly reduce the bill or look for other financial opportunities. Yes. Uh, one of the previous slides said something about the certain um, costs where you have to add additional costs when you can have on the new board and the different costs and something about co ops on there. Yeah, that's the cost of attendance. Right, so that cost of attendance, if you're looking at, say, University of Penn, they give you a cost of attendance. What does that cost of attendance include? Most includes, they're telling you the tuition and fees, the room and board. Um, miscellaneous, but sometimes like if you go to Drexel, so I know they have an internship program embedded, they may include those co-op costs. So each school cost of attendance may differ. There's a cost to actually partake in this part, even though the kids will get paid for these co-op That question I can't answer. That's specific to schools who offer co-ops. Well, I mean, yeah. There, there might be. Yes, ma'am. Yes. How do you choose which students are eligible to have that work on campus? It is need based. So when you file the FAFSA, students are automatically considered if they have need and then there's still funding for that program. Most student schools automatically award students federal work study. If you don't see it on the award letter, you can always inquire why wasn't I eligible or my student. And most schools may have a wait list or they may defer to campus employment. Yes. Uh, the list you have for the schools that do CSS, is that available online anyway? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's offered by the College Board. So if you Google College Board, all information about CSS comes up. Yes? If, in fact, the parents combined have nice income and have a, a fair amount of assets, a lot of this is uh, a waste of time? I wouldn't say a waste of time, but you will get the um, federal loan for 5500 So, I mean, it may not seem a lot, but to some people, it may seem a lot. Oh, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're correct. Oh, and private scholarship searches. Here are a list of some websites that the state of New Jersey wanted me to share. Um, basically, what a lot of these searches do, they ask for students' information, what their interests are, um, what their major they want to study, their different interests, and then what they do, they send those students targeted scholarships that the student then can apply for. So basically, it does the, the search process uh, um, for the students. It makes it a lot simpler. So these are some websites um, that students can explore. Um, New Jersey Best College Savings Plan. Um, he's also wanted me to talk about, they do offer NJ Best. It's the only 529 savings plan. And if you're currently invested in that, they have a scholarship. So if you go to the HESA website and you're already invested in this New Jersey Best, you can then apply for a scholarship, which they grant for anyone that's enrolled in the New Jersey Best 529 plan through the state of New Jersey.
Here are some websites. This is the HESA website. So if you have any additional questions, they, um, HESA talks about all types of aid, not just state aid. So there's resources out there for families. Um, and then they also have a financial aid hotline if you have specific questions. Even if you want to talk about the TAG grant program or why you weren't eligible, what have you, you can give them a call. Typically, they're there until about 8 o'clock at night. And then NJ Best and then MappingYourFuture.org. That's a site that also gives additional general financial aid information. And then a lot of students may have to go to that specific website to say um, complete interest loan counseling if they're a first time loan borrower. Any additional questions? Or if you have specific questions you want to talk about not public, I can, I'm going to be after. Yes, ma'am. Is the presentation available? It's available online, right? On the website? Yeah, uh, this, is being, this is being videotaped. You uh, didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> and, um, it's going to be in the guidance newsletter, and it should be on the website all well, by the end of the month, I hope. Yes, and then I'll take you in the back. Yes. Can you explain the, um, the IRS retrieval? Uh, the question was explain the IRS data retrieval. When you're completing the FAFSA and you come to the income portion, the FAFSA will ask you a series of questions, like if you filed your taxes and some other questions. Then you may have the option to link to the IRS if you filed your taxes already, and they will populate that income section for you. Okay, if you file your taxes, you must wait at least two weeks because IRS has to receive it and process your taxes um, for you to use that feature. You okay. about electronically filing it or you electronically filing. Yes, if you file via if you file via paper, you have to wait six to eight weeks to use that feature. But again, the benefit of doing that is that you're less likely to be considered selected for verification. So can you go to the fast and start start answering the questions? Save it. Yes, you can always save it. Yep, mm -hmm. there's a feature to save it. Yes. Yes, you can. There's a question in the back, I thought. Yes. For uh, uh, form, if there's any correction needed, is it typically done by March? Um, or is there like a deadline where you have to have corrections made? There's no deadline, really. The most, um, if you're a student as a freshman, you want to have the most accurate information in, but like a lot of students even come to TCNJ, they may not have filed their taxes even by March, but they give us the estimate, we can um, at least give them an estimated financial aid award letter, and it says estimate because if you have to go in and make changes or we have to audit your file, it can always change. But typically, you know, if you're trying to make a decision by May, you want to make sure it's as accurate as possible. Um, the FAFSA is usually available, like I said, January 1, I know most schools start downloading applications in February. That's when they begin to process and get those estimates out. So if you're not sure, you want to give your best guess if you, don't, if you haven't filed your taxes. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned about being able to recalculate for someone. So if I get to the point where my child is trying to decide between two New Jersey schools, we can get the financial aid officers from each to calculate what their real award would be based on how they would get different awards from New Jersey? Mm, you mean if if you file the FAFSA? Yeah, we filed the FAFSA and you had said that depending on which institution we have first, that on, the New Jersey on the FAFSA, that affects which what the New Jersey award might The New Jersey award, correct. So, right. So if if we come down to the point where we're trying to decide between two New Jersey schools, we're gonna need to know what the New Jersey award. Then I will call Hesa and say, I selected T C and J as my first school, now my son may want to go to Ryder. How much would I get if I go to Ryder? Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm and you typically, if, you come, if you're visiting that school, um, I have the ability to log in if you were one of our um, prospective students, and I can go in and do recap myself and tell you, oh, your award may go to this amount. So yes. Everyone get that answer? He was basically asking, if he filed the FAFSA and listed one New Jersey school first, down at crunch time, they're not sure, and they want to go to another New Jersey school, but they don't know how much TAG grant eligibility, what I suggested is calling the state and say, if my child now goes to a school in New Jersey, how much grant would I receive or would I be eligible? So you can always call the state and they can give you an estimate. They're very busy at that time, but you may have to wait. Any other questions? Yes. When you filled out the FAFSA and file, but you didn't have a tax check, can you go back later and then do that option for the IRS? Yes, you can. Yes. So I have two children that are seniors 
And I have another one who's interested in going to college also next year, so I have three. Mm -hmm. So what happens, how do they all talk to each other, and what if one of them decides not to go? You, in your case, you have to file, you said you have two um, children currently going to school next year? Yeah. You have to file two independent FAFSAs. Okay. okay. I have three, because if I have a third one who's already out of school wants to go, so I have to do three FAFSAs. Well, it depends. The third, the, uh, the third child, how old are they? He's 19. Okay, yeah, then he went in with three FAFSAs. Right. Correct. And so if for some reason he doesn't follow through on that. Then you want to go back in, update your FAFSA, and say now instead of me having um, say five in a household and three in college, now I'm going to have five in a household and two in college. So that way a recal can be done to see if there's any change in your eligibility. And thank, hopefully I will get more because I'll have a crazy It may. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. So I understand the CSS profile. You said we should go to school and find out if they're required. Right. Well, you can always Google CSS profile, and it's online. It tells you all the schools that require it. It's 400 schools. And then if you have specific questions about how they prefer you file or whether you file it with estimated income or wait until you have the actual, I would just call that school directly, especially, especially if that's a, um, high on the student's list, and just ask them. And the, the FAFSA, that is just in general for any college you want to go to? Correct. That's a federal form. Yes, sir. Yes. I assume some schools have their own forms in addition to these. Yes? Mainly, again, that's your um, highly selective schools with large endowments. Like TCNJ, we're a public school. We're only giving you federal and state funding. We don't have a separate application. But say your Princeton, your Harvard, or other schools that are highly selective that may be on that list, they may have another institutional form <laughs> in, in, and not um, associated with the CSS profile that you may have to answer. Yeah. So just always an inquiry, you know, if I file in the FAFSA, is there any other financial aid form that I have to file? Typically, if it's a public school, it's just a FAFSA. Yes. Once your, your EFC number is determined, family, expected family contribution, I suspect some schools are better at bridging the gap with A's than other schools are. It depends if the school, that school has institutional dollars to award. Is there, uh, is there a good online resource to sort of know in advance which schools are better at bridging that gap? Basically, I would talk to the school. Like I said, if it's a state school, the state is, may have the federal the state aid and then whatever scholarship dollars they award. You may want to even ask, you know, how much scholarship dollars do you award? How many student incoming students receive scholarships to give you an idea? I mean, a lot of times you hear in the news, oh, call a financial aid office, they can negotiate. A lot of times we can't, depending upon the type of school and the type of aid we have to offer. So, but we do our best. And then also, I just want to mention, I can bridge the gap a lot of times in my office, but unfortunately I talk to people and it's loan dollars. A lot of people don't want to hear loans, but that is an option if that's the student's goal to go to college, but it may not be the option that you want to hear. So, it depends. To answer this question, if you Google, there are lots of lists available of schools with the largest endowments. That will probably be a good indicator of schools that can fill the gap. Yes. I, you know, me, I'm missing something on point here, but I know we're talking about the money end of it, but it's nice to go through all this, but, you know, RNSATs and your, your grade point average, where does that come into play be before, after? Or? That comes in with the um, students, the school's merit scholarships. So if you're looking at schools, I know even at our institution, parents want to know how, do my, how does my student qualify for a scholarship? And our admissions office actually says we look at SAT, we look at class rank, and those are our top factors. We may look at your activities or what have you, but I would really inquire with the admissions um, office, how do you award your scholarships? What are you looking for? Are you looking for you know, the GPA now? I know some schools may, um, when you students send their acceptance letter, they may have a scholarship application, I mean, a scholarship letter included in that application. You know, you may really want to ask, well, if the GPA increases at the end, will you reevaluate it? So a lot of those merit dollars are up to the school to award. So I would really inquire, what are you looking, what are you looking at, what are you looking for? And they'll tell you. Yes. Um, I'm not sure on this. Did you say that the non-custodial parent doesn't have to include their income? They will next year, yes. So when I file it next year, I have to include, you know, his income? Correct. There's a question that's going to say, um, are your parents unmarried? Yes. Okay, my other question is, 
um, if he is remarried and has a family, is that that their income as a whole is that going to be included in the fashion? Good question. We're still waiting to look to see how they're going to in incorporate that information on the FAFSA. We haven't seen a new FAFSA yet, but yeah. Okay. So I, I would have to have him fill out that portion too, so I have no idea. You may, or depending upon the situation, file it together, I'm not sure. You're yeah, waiting to see exactly how they're going to um, incorporate all that information on the FAFSA. This just came out, so we're still waiting for additional communication from the federal government. Okay. So that'll be straight out? Huh? Yes, it has to be. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so you have to pull it out together. <laughs> 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 oh, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yes. It came up earlier about the FAFSA forecast. You said you were going to get back to it for one of the questions back there. Oh, yeah, there is a um, FAFSA forecaster, so you can also Google FAFSA forecast as another option if you want to have additional information as you're doing the FAFSA research. So have you done it before? You want to share your experience, experience with it? Basically, the FAFSA doesn't open until the 1st of January, but the FAFSA forecaster is available now, and it's on the government website. So you can get some sense. Yes, ma'am? Is the child who receives a merit scholarship, that, that's first, right? Um, it depends upon the school. I can only give you our example where I worked. I know um, they're evaluating applications now. At our institution, when we send out acceptance letter, if that student is eligible for a scholarship, it's included in that award letter. So I would talk to the schools that you're applying to to say, when will I know if my child will receive a merit scholarship? So they, some schools may say, oh, we wait to the FAFSA, so I would doubt that, but it may be included with the admissions app with the acceptance letter, but I would inquire, because each school has a different awarding process for their own institutional aid. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you once again. It will be on the website and it is taped. <laughs> and if you didn't get a CD, make sure you pick up a CD. That CD is um, provided by New Jersey HESA. So it has general information and some of the same information um, that I've discussed this evening.